Hare Krishna, uh, dear devotees, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we can seek your good wishes and your blessings to continue with the ninth canto of the Bhagavatam, uh, seventh chapter, uh, seventh and eighth chapter today, hopefully. I have to say chapter seven is uh, one of the really challenging um, chapters in the Bhagavatam. It, it uh, gives us a few pastimes which are quite difficult to uh, understand and reconcile. Anyway, we will try to uh, go through them as best as we can. So this is the verse that we can recite, uh, 24th verse of the 7th chapter of the ninth Canto. Satyam sharam bitam drishtva sabhayashya chabhupate vishwamitro vishamprito tadavahitatam gatim The great sage Vishwamitra saw that Maharaj Harishchandra along with his wife, was truthful, forbearing, and concerned with the essence. Thus, he gave them imperishable knowledge to, for fulfillment of the human mission. Okay, so this part, uh, the chapter uh, talks about the glories of Harisha Chandra, a very truthful king who was tested by Vishwamitra. So, we start with the, the chapter's name is Descendants of King uh, Mandata, Mandata. In this chapter, the descendants of King Mandata are described, and in this connection, the histories of Puru, uh, Puru uh, Kutsa and Harishchandra are also given. So we start with Puru Kutsa, his son of Mandata. The most prominent son of Mandata was Ambarish. So we've talked about Ambarish already. His son was uh, Yova Nashva, and Navavashya's son was Harita. Harita. Harita, and these three personalities were the best in the dynasty of Mandata. Uh, Puru Kutsa, another name, another son of Mandata, Mandata, married the sister of the snakes, Sarpagana, named Narma, Narmada, in uh, Rasatala, the lower region of the universe. Puru Kutsa, being empowered by Lord Vishnu, was able to kill all the Gandharvas who deserved to be killed. So generally, the Gandharvas are fairly, uh, they actually entertain the heavenly personality, but some of them can be not very nice. So Puru Kutsa uh, did the job of finishing them off. The son of Puru, Puru Kutsa was Trasadasyu, whose son was Anaryanya. Ran, uh, Anaryanya's son was Hariya. Hariyashwa, Harishwa, Harashwa, Har Hariyashwa son was Praruna. Praruna's son was Tribandana, and Tribandana's son was Satyavrta, also known as Trishanku. And Trishanku is quite famous. So this is a, just a pictorial description of what we've just said. And we're going to talk about Trishanku, who's also known as, as Satyavrta. So who is this uh, Trish? Shanku. When Satyavrat, also known as Trishanku, kidnapped the daughter of a Brahmin, his father cursed him for this sinful act. So, yeah, his father cursed him, right? Um, and his father is Tribandan, Tribandana. Uh, Trishanku became a Chandala, so worse than a Shudra. That was the curse. He became known um, because uh, he became known because of that way, because, Trishunka, because of three faults. He displeased his father, he also killed a cow, and he ate its flesh as well. So these are uh, the reasons he's known as Trishanku. Later, he performed a yagya to go to heaven, and with the power of Vishwamitra, he was brought to the heavenly planets. He didn't deserve to go to heaven, but Vishwamitra wanted to show his, uh, the strength of his tapasya. <laughs> but because they, he, Trishanka wasn't, Trishanka wasn't wanted in, by the demigods, especially Indra, by the influence of the demigods, he fell back downwards. He was stopped in his fall, however, by the influence of Vishwamitra. And even today, he can still be seen hanging in the sky. 
head downward. <laughs> so he's there uh, in this unfortunate situation, head downward. He's neither here, neither there. And this is partly because of Vishwamitra's strength of keeping him up and the, the demigods not wanting him in heaven. <laughs> The son of Trishanka was Harishchandra. Harishchandra once performed a Rajasuya Rakyakya. But Vishwamitra cunningly took all of Harishchandra's possessions on the pretext of a Dakshina contribution and chastised Harishchandra in various ways. Because of this, a quarrel rose between Vishwamitra and Vashishta. Harishchandra had no sons, but on the advice of Narad Muni, so beforehand, before that, um, conflict or that test by Vishwamitra. On the advice of Narada, he worshipped Varun, um, who was the demigod of water, and in this way got a son called Rohit. Harishchandra promised um, that Rohit would be used to perform a Varun Yagya. So he got the son on the basis that Rohit will be the subject of the sacrifice. Yes, um, uh, this is the dynasty of uh, Mandata. Mandata. This is the Sun dynasty. Surya Vams. Varun. Sorry? Ikswaku. Yes. Same, same. Good. Very good. Varun reminded Harishchandra repeatedly about this yagya. So they had the boy, but the king, because of affection for his son, gave various arguments to avoid sacrificing him. That's pretty heavy. <laughs> it's pretty heavy. So he, the excuses were this. The animal or, or whoever's going to be sacrificed only becomes fit 10 days after birth. And then the 10 days after birth came, Varun came to Harishchandra and said, okay, time for the sacrifice. Rohit needs to be sacrificed. Then Harishchandra said, well, when an animal grows teeth, then it becomes pure enough to be sacrificed. So the animal, uh, oh, Harish, uh, Rohit grew teeth and uh, Varun came again. Yet again, Harishchandra said, okay, actually when all its teeth have fallen out, then it is fit for sacrifice. <laughs> so the baby teeth. Um, when they fell out, Varun came again. Harishchandra said then, when the animal street go in again, then he will be pure enough to be sacrificed. So again, that happened. Varun came. Harishchandra said, this time he said, well, when the sacrificial animal is able to fight with the enemy, then he will be purified. So Rohit needs to be of a proper age yeah, where he can fight. So he, he gave excuse after excuse. And time passed. Gradually, the son grew. Rohit grew up. And he found out that he was the subject of the sacrifice. And he didn't want to be sacrificed. So he took bow and arrow in his hand and he went into the forest. In the meantime, Harish Chandra, he suffered from uh, dropsy, whatever that is. What's that? Anyway, he suffered that, that because he was cursed by uh, Varun. When Rohit received the news that his father was suffering, he wanted to return back to the kingdom. But King um, Indra Dev came, disguised as an old Brahmin, and he stopped Rohit from going back to the kingdom. He advised him, go to the holy places. You need to purify your existence. And he followed those instructions of Indra, and he lived in the forest. He lived in the holy places for six years. And then he finally returned home. So he was a young man by the time he returned home. So, of course, returning home meant he had to be sacrificed. He was going to be subject of sacrifice. But what Rohit did, he managed to buy somebody in his place to be sacrificed. He purchased uh, Sunha Shepa. Sunha Shepa. Now, this name will come up again uh, in the 16th chapter. We will see this again. So now we're in the seventh, about nine chapters later, we're going to see Sunar Shepherd come again. He's the second son of Ajigarta. And um, 
Ajigata gave Sunna Shepa uh, to his to the father, to Freud's father, Harishchandra, as the sacrificial animal. That's pretty heavy. Eh? He had three sons, and he, uh, he he liked the first son and he liked the last son, but he didn't wasn't too keen on the second son, Sunna Shepa, and he gave him to Harishchandra <laughs> to be sacrificed. That's pretty heavy stuff. In this way, the sacrifice was performed. And Varun and the other demigods were pacified, and Harishchandra was freed from his disease. So, in this sacrifice, Vishwamitra was the chief uh, priest. So, some really important personality. Jandagni um, was the Adhar, Adhar view, uh, chanting the Yujur Ved hymns. Vashishta was the chief Brahmanical priest. Ayashya was the Udgata chanting the Samaveta hymns. So this sacrifice took place. King Gindra, being sa satisfied by the sacrifice, gave Harishchandra a golden chariot. And then actually, Shuna Shepa, who was to be sacrificed, was not sacrificed because he was greatly advanced in spiritual life. The demigods uh, protected him. They didn't kill him. He didn't die because as, as a result of the sacrifice. So this, I suppose, is quite challenging to understand um, why a human being is being sacrificed and why these exalted personalities are involved in that sacrifice. But this is the Bhagavatam. We accept it at face value. But it is a, it is a very challenging aspect of the Bhagavatam, this chapter 7, Canto 9, to fully appreciate this. Is not easy. The great sage Vishwamitra saw that Harishchandra, along with his wife, was truthful, forbearing, and concerned with the essence, essence of spiritual life. Thus he gave them imperishable knowledge for fulfillment of human mission, transcendental knowledge. When the self-realized spiritual soul is engaged in service to the Lord, he is eternally imperceptible and inconceivable. Thus established in spiritual knowledge, he is completely freed from material bondage. So that's the end of chapter seven. Any questions or any comments, please? Haribo. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Jai Shri Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Yeah, it's quite, when you uh, say certain things within this chapter are very, I wouldn't say controversial, but, but they're quite, challenging to accept or something but mm -hmm. uh, Prabhupada makes a comment in, in connection with that um, when he purchases <laughs> mm. that uh, what was his name his name is very uh, Suna Shepa Suna yeah, Shepa and he purchases him but Prabhupada said that you know in, even in those days and it's just nothing new that there is uh, slavery and Mm. People sold off in slavery. Even we know from Jad Bharat the story that you know Jad Bharat at one time was just sold off into, for, you know, given up and were ready for sacrificing, wasn't he? Mm. Um, Jad Bharat, and then you know the the Kali Mata just saved him because he was a devotee. So these sort of things do happen, and then. But the sacrifice for human beings, I suppose, in those days, with the mantras so powerful that they could actually uh, give them a higher birth or something. So I think that's how I understand it. But yeah. I would agree. I'd agree. But uh, if that's the case, why didn't the demigods allow him to be sacrificed if he's going to get a higher birth? But they actually, yeah. Him. So maybe but there must be a reason. Like later on, it might come up. You know, there's a reason. Mm -hmm. Like you say in chapter 16, something else happens. Um, yeah. Sort of, that's for a reason. But anyway, that'll be I suppose uh, in one sense, yeah. Okay, in one sense, because he was spiritually advanced, uh, the best that would he would have achieved from being sacrificed was the heavenly planets. But because he was spiritually advanced, the demigods perhaps were thinking, actually, he'll attain the spiritual world in due course. So let's not say mm. Maybe that's the... Yeah, maybe that was come up in 16th chapter, so we'll wait and see. 
We'll wait and see. Because he does mention does mention that you know he he comes back in connection with somebody else. So later on, yeah, it'll come up. Okay, Haribo. Anything else? Anybody else? Otherwise, let's go to the chapter eight. Uh, okay. Tomaya rachite loke vastu budaya kihadishu Pramante kama lobeshya moha vibransa chetasaha. Oh, my Lord, those whose hearts are bewildered by the influence of lust, greed, envy, and illusion are interested only in false hearth and home in this world created by your Maya. Attached to home, wife, and children, they wander in this material world perpetually. Mm -hmm. Interesting uh, verse, and it basically says uh, our hearts are generally, uh, you know, influenced by these horrible qualities, and hence why we are always attached to home and family, and we are always going to be in this world. So this is the things that we have to guard against and try to overcome through the mercy of the uh, the guru, the devotees, and Radha Krishna. So this is very interesting chapters now. Uh, sons of Sagar uh, meet Lord Kapil. So in this chapter, the descendants of Rohit are described in the dynasty of Rohit, there's a king named Sagar. So the son of Rohit was known as Harit, Harit and the son of Harit was Champa, Champa uh, who constructed a township called Champapuri. The son of Champa was Sudev, the son of Sudev was Vijay, and the son of Vijay was uh, Baruch, and the son of Baruch was Vikra. Uh, bah Bahuka Bahuk was the son of Vikra, was greatly disturbed by his enemies, and therefore he left home with his wife and went to the forest. When he died there, his wife wanted to accept the principle of Sati, dying with her husband. But when she was about to die, a sage named Urva found that she was pregnant and forbade her to do so. The co-wives of this wife of Bahu gave her poison with her food and still, but still her son was born with the poison. So there's the, um, the family sort of tree that we just described in Champa, he built that Champa Puri. So the son therefore was named Sagar. So the Sagar is the one who was given the poison and yet he survived. Sa means with and Gar means with uh, means poison, <laughs> Sagar. King Sagar had two wives named Sumati and uh, Keshini. Following the instructions of the great sage Urva, Sagar reformed many clans, including the Yavanas, the Shak Shakhas, Hayyas, Babaras. The king did not kill them, but reformed them. So he changed their habits into from bad habits to good habits. Then again, following the instructions of Orva, Orva, King Sagar performed Ashwamedha sacrifices. Okay. So one time they did a sacrifice. He performed a sacrifice and he was, uh, he used a horse. But that horse was stolen by Indra because Indra became somewhat envious of the Yagya, thinking that Sagar will attain great uh, power. While searching for this horse, 60,000 sons of Sumita, uh, 60,000 sons of Sumita, just see. One of the wives. Ah, oh, yes, good, good. Yeah, well done. One of the wives of Sagar. Sagar's sons. Yeah, very good. So Sagar's sons, yeah. Thank you were very proud of their prowess and influence, extensively dug up the surface of the earth. And in this way, they dug a trench, which later became known as the Sagar Ocean. In the course of this search, they came upon the great personality Kapildev. And with their intelligence stolen by Indra, so this was deliberately stolen actually, they thought Kapil, Lord Kapil had stolen the horse because Kapildev was there. But give up the story. Yes. That's right, very good. With this offensive understanding, they attacked him and they were all burned to ashes. 
by the fire emanating from their own bodies. So Sika, the strength of Kapil Dev. So the 60,000 children, oh, sons of Sagar died. Keshini, the second wife of King Sagar, had a son named Asamanjasha. Asamanjash. Formerly in his previous birth, Asamanjash had been a great mystic yogi, but by bad association, he had fallen from his exalted position. So in this life, he was able to remember his past birth, Jatisma. So this is the mercy of the Lord. Nonetheless, he wanted to display himself as a miscreant, hiding his true nature. And he would drown the boys who were sporting in the river Sarayu. <laughs> Due to this abominable activities, his father exiled him. <laughs> then Asha Manjasa exhibited his mystic power by reviving the boys and bringing them before the king and their parents. After this, Asa Manjasa left Ayodhya and King Sagar greatly lamented the absence of his son. So this is a little bit, uh, if you like, like Jad Bharat, mm -hmm. a little bit like Jad Bharat. But Jad Bharat just acted blind, uh, deaf and dumb. Whereas here, Asa Manjasa acted foolishly. Uh, he drowned the boys. And then he brought them back to life. So he shows his exalted position. And then he left home. Oh. Asha Mansa Dasha's son was Amshun Man, who later searched for the horse and delivered his uncles. Upon Kapil Dev, uh, approaching up Kapil Dev, Amshun Man saw both the horse meant for the sacrifice and a pile of ashes. Amshuman offered prayers to Kapil Dev. So these are nice prayers. My Lord, you are fully situated in everyone's heart, but no one can see you, since they are influenced by external energy. Sages freed from the influence of the free modes of material energy. Sages such as the four Kumaras, Sanat, Sanakan, Sanananda, and Sanatan, are able to think of you who are concentrated knowledge. But how can an ignorant person like me think of you? Simply by seeing you, I have now been freed from all lusty desires, which are the root cause of insurmountable illusion and bondage in the material world. You assume a form resembling a material body just to give us instructions, but actually you are the supreme person. I therefore offer my respectful obeisances unto you. So these are really nice prayers. And Kapil Dev was very pleased with these prayers and he returned the horse. Uh, to Amshuman. After getting back the horse, Amshuman st still stood before Kapil and Kapil Dev could understand that Amsh Amshuman was praying for the deliverance of his forefathers, the 60,000 um, sons or his uncles rather. Kapil Dev offered the instruction that they can be delivered by water from the Ganga. Amshuman then offered respectful obeisances to Kapil Dev, circumambulated him and left that place with the horse for sacrifice. When King Sagar finished his sacrifice, he handed over the kingdom to Hamshuman and followed the advice of Arva, attained salvation. So that's the end of chapter number eight. Um, very interesting chapter. So any questions, any comments? Tomorrow we'll see... Um, Ganga coming. Okay. So, uh, Mother Sudan Babu, we like to. Okay, that's fine. Yep, yep. So, tomorrow we'll try to uh, take on chapters nine and ten. Uh, nine is Ganga coming down, and tenth is Lord Ramachandra's pastimes. Very interesting. Uh, Mother Sudan Babu? Okay, is that Haribo? Hare Krishna? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so you will go to the instructions, yeah? So yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Like you said, this this chapter in, in the whole canto is just amazing, actually. But So uh, we can see from uh, chapter 7, yeah? From the incident between Vishwamitra and 
Vashishta cursing each other and becoming birds and continued fighting for a long time over Harish Chandra. We mm -hmm. can take instruction that uh, even great personalities can become a victim of sense gratification. This is the material world, you know, as confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita as well, that, you know, a, a Brahma Bhutan Loka Unar Evartinta Arjuna. So Sri Prabhupada comments in this purport also that, you know, within this material world or within this universe, however elevated one may, uh, one may be in material qualities and a must, one must suffer the uh, conditions of birth, death, old age and disease. So there's no escape from all that, no matter where you are. And it's amazing how this personality is hanging upside down. I mean, Makes me wonder, you know, when you come across something like that, uh, it's like a bit like who needs science fiction, you know, when you go about to me. <laughs> but anyway, that's I, I, I had to sometimes take. I know it's human Bhagavatam. Go to take it seriously. We we accept whatever he said because Sukadev Goswami says it and Shastra says it. So. It is there, you know. We might not be explained, we might not be able to explain all these things, but we have to accept as it is, you know. And Prabhupada has helped us in his purpose to clarify a lot, a lot of things, you know. So important to um, read his purpose as well. So we, it becomes clearer, you know, like. So, chapter eight, this verse in this chapter clearly shows how Lord Kapila was greeted by the sons of King Sagar were about what, 60,000 of them or something, mm. and, and, and one of his uh, two wives, Sumati. So they approached Lord Kapila and didn't recognize him for who he was or anything. And uh, yet, you know, Lord Kapila is the one who propagated and, and, and given Sankhya Yoga for, through which, you know, we can um, li liberate and uh, attain bhakti. So his, his instructions, instructions are amazing. But they didn't recognize him for who they were, and they began to attack him. But then also Prabhupada explained that, you know, uh, some way other Acharya commented that uh, Lord Kapila didn't actually burn all these people through his mm. eyesight or anything like that, because he is so much in the mode of goodness. Mm. And even beyond that, that he would not take that sort of step. So I don't really know how it was. Um, it was just uh, heat you know, from within their own bodies uh, got them the, from the upper. That's room. right. Yeah. yeah, because Lord Kapila wouldn't have done with his eyes as a revenge, yeah. you're attacking me, so in defense or anything like that, no. He's just uh, in a pure, well, as, as confirmed by uh, was Ansuman, you know, when, when they were searching for the horse. They were obviously searching for the horse, both parties. Mm. But the outcome is very clear, you know, and, and the Lord Kapila then says, you know, the, or, or to, to uh, what's his name, uh, Ansuman, um, that the personality of God had said, he said, my dear Ansuman, here is the animal uh, sought by your fathers for sacrifice. Please take it. As for your forefathers who have been burned to ashes, they can be delivered on, only by Ganges water and not by any other means. So it just also shows how, um, not powerful, I wouldn't say, but how liberating Ganges water can be, you know. For those mm. souls, forefathers. So thank you, Haribo, Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Any comments? Any questions? Otherwise, we can uh, go to the uh, Nasinga Kavach. Okay.